Hello and welcome to PharmaZ's pharmacy teaching videos. The topic we're going to be covering today is hypertension and that's a high weighted topic in the GPHC exam. All the information we're providing is based on the most recent guidelines by NICE who updated it in 2019. Hypertension is defined as a persistently raised arterial blood pressure, which increases the risk of stroke, myocardial infarction, heart failure, chronic kidney disease and premature morbidity and mortality. So of course the aim of treating hypertension is to reduce these risks. Risk factors include advancing age, women aged 65 to 74 years, patients of black African or African Caribbean family origin, emotional stress and anxiety, and lifestyle factors, which include smoking, lack of exercise, increased BMI, and dietary factors such as high alcohol and caffeine consumption, high dietary salt intake, high total and saturated fat intake, and poor fruit and vegetable intake. So whilst the first three risk factors are uncontrollable, it's important to offer support to patients to make healthy changes to their lifestyle and bear in mind that these need to be practical. So an older patient won't be able to carry out intensive exercise as a lifestyle change. Instead, you might be able to advise them to move around the house a little bit more, use the stairs, the steps, and just avoid a sedentary lifestyle in general. And you can set goals and targets for that patient. This is really important because many pharmacies are now becoming healthy living pharmacies. And if you're carrying out the smoking cessation service, you can highlight that quitting smoking reduces the risk of hypertension and that therefore reduces other complications that might occur that we've discussed. So what are the thresholds for treatment? Well, normal blood pressure is around 120 systolic over 80 diastolic, and there are three stages of hypertension. Stage 1 is a clinic blood pressure of 140 over 90 and an ambulatory daytime or home average blood pressure of 135 over 85. The reason why we undertake both sets of measurements is because in a clinical setting there's something called white coat hypertension effect in which some patients may have a blood pressure that's slightly elevated in the examination process because of nervousness or anxiety caused by being in a clinical setting. So that can cause a discrepancy of more than 20 over 10 between the clinic and the ambulatory or home average blood pressure measurements. So it's really important to undertake both in order to confirm the hypertension diagnosis as well as the stage of hypertension. For stage 1, we treat patients under 80 years who have target organ damage, cardiovascular disease, renal disease, diabetes or a 10 year cardiovascular risk equal to or more than 10%. If they're over 80 years, antihypertensives may be considered if their clinic blood pressure is more than 150 over 90. For stage 2, that's a clinic blood pressure of 160 over 100 and an ambulatory daytime or home average blood pressure of 150 over 95. And in stage two, we treat all patients regardless of their age. For severe hypertension, that's a clinic systolic blood pressure equal to or more than 180, or a clinic diastolic blood pressure equal to or more than 120. And in those cases, we treat patients promptly. Often that requires a same day specialist referral. Just a note to bear in mind that blood pressure is measured whilst standing and sitting in patients with type 2 diabetes, symptoms of postural hypotension or if they're aged 80 years or above, um, rather than just doing the simple sitting down blood pressure monitoring that you often see. So targets for treatment. For patients under 80 years, we aim for a clinic blood pressure equal to or less than 140 over 90 and an ambulatory or home blood pressure equal to or less than 135 over 85. For patients over 80 years, we aim slightly higher. So a clinic blood pressure equal to or less than 150 over 90 and an ambulatory or home blood pressure equal to or less than 145 over 85. For patients who have postural hypotension, we base a target on their standing blood pressure. And these targets are a general guide, but they're adapted based on the fragility of the patient and their tolerability and multimorbidity. 
So moving on to drug treatments. A single antihypertensive isn't usually enough for the management of hypertension, so we follow a stepwise treatment ladder until control is achieved. Antihypertensives are titrated to the optimum or maximum tolerated dose at each step of treatment before moving on to the next step. So let's have a look at this in a little bit more detail. For any patient with type 2 diabetes, regardless of their age or ethnicity, or in patients under 55 years, first line treatment is an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. If an ACE inhibitor isn't tolerated because it causes a dry cough, for example, then we'd offer the ARB instead, but it's not recommended to use both of them together for hypertension. If that isn't enough, we add in a calcium channel blocker or thiazide-like diuretic. If the calcium channel blocker isn't tolerated because of causing edema, as patients can complain of ankle swelling, then we'd offer the thiazide-like diuretic instead, and that's usually in dapamide. We'd also offer the thiazide-like diuretic in preference if there's evidence of heart failure in the patient. Third would be a combination of ACE inhibitor or ARB plus the calcium channel blocker plus the thiazide-like diuretic. And fourth would be known as a case of resistant hypertension, so where they haven't responded adequately to the above three medications. In that case, what we first do is confirm the elevated blood pressure with ambulatory or home blood pressure monitoring, we check for postural hypotension, and we discuss adherence to the drug treatments with the patient. So are they actually taking their medications? If they have been, then at that point we seek expert advice, or add in a low-dose spironolactone if the potassium levels in the blood are equal to or less than 4.5 millimoles per litre, or an alpha or beta blocker if the potassium levels are more than 4.5 millimoles per litre. We'd also seek expert advice if the blood pressure is uncontrolled or they're on an optimal tolerated dose on all four drugs. So for patients of black African or African Caribbean family origin who don't have diabetes but are of any age, or patients over 55 years, the first line treatment is slightly different, so we reorder. They are offered first a calcium channel blocker, and then for second line we add in an ACE inhibitor, ARB or thiazide-like diuretic. For patients of African or Caribbean origin, the preference is a calcium channel blocker in combination with an ARB, and that's because these patients respond better to ARBs. And for third line and fourth line treatment, we treat it the same as being under 55 years, so what we've already covered. Moving on to hypertension in other comorbidities. So in type 1 diabetes, we aim to reduce blood pressure in order to reduce the risk of macrovascular and microvascular complications. The target clinic blood pressure is equal to or less than 135 over 85, but if type 1 diabetes is accompanied by albuminuria or two or more features of metabolic syndrome, then the target is equal to or less than 130 over 80. In terms of treatment, we start with an ACE inhibitor or ARB and work from there, so similar to type 2 diabetes. And in renal disease, so chronic kidney disease for example, the target is equal to or less than 140 over 90, but if renal disease is accompanied by diabetes or if the urine albumin creatinine ratio is equal to or more than 70 mg per millimole, then the target is equal to or less than 130 over 80. In terms of treatment, we aim to use once daily drugs and we usually start off with an ACE inhibitor or ARB and that's because these are renoprotective. We monitor EGFR as many antihypertensives are renally eliminated as well as blood potassium levels as they can cause hyperkalemia as a side effect. Moving on to hypertension in pregnancy. Now the guidelines have recently changed on this quite drastically. Around 10% of pregnant women are affected by hypertensive disorders, which can cause serious complications to both mother and baby, both in terms of morbidity and mortality. There are three types of hypertension in pregnancy. 
Chronic, which is hypertension diagnosed pre-pregnancy or in the first 20 weeks gestation. Gestational hypertension, which is new onset hypertension after 20 weeks gestation. And preeclampsia, which is hypertension occurring after 20 weeks gestation with multi-organ involvement. Symptoms can include headache, vision problems, severe pain below the ribs, vomiting and sudden swelling of the hands, feet or face accompanied with significant proteinuria and blood pressure over 140 over 90. Pregnant women are at a high risk of developing preeclampsia if they have chronic kidney disease, diabetes mellitus, autoimmune disease, chronic hypertension or if they've had hypertension in a previous pregnancy. And in these cases, women are advised to take aspirin from week 12 of pregnancy until the baby is born. Similarly, if a woman has more than one moderate risk factor for developing preeclampsia, then they're also advised to take aspirin. In all cases of hypertension in pregnancy, including chronic, gestational and preeclampsia, patients should be referred to a specialist. So how do we treat it? In pregnant women who have chronic hypertension and they were already receiving antihypertensives, they'll have their ACE inhibitors, ARBs, thiazide or thiazide-like diuretics stopped and that's because they can cause an increased risk of congenital abnormalities. In pregnant women with a sustained blood pressure of 140 over 90 or higher, they're offered libitolol orally first line and that's to achieve a target blood pressure of 135 over 85 or less. If libitolol is unsuitable, then we'd consider nifedipine modified release, although that's unlicensed. And if both libitolol and nifedipine are unsuitable, then we'd consider methyl dopa, but again, that's unlicensed. In women with a blood pressure of greater than 160 over 110, they would require critical care and should receive immediate treatment with either oral or intravenous libitolol, oral nifedipine modified release, or intravenous hydralazine. And again, that's to achieve a target blood pressure of 135 over 85 or less. For severe hypertension or severe preeclampsia, patients are given intravenous magnesium sulfate in a critical care setting. Appropriate antihypertensive treatment should be continued if required after birth with the dose adjustments according to blood pressure. And women who've been managed with methyl dopa during pregnancy should discontinue treatment within two days of the birth and be switched to an alternative antihypertensive. And finally, hypertension in breastfeeding. So women who are on antihypertensives in the postnatal period can still breastfeed if they wish to do so. For women who do decide to breastfeed, we offer enalapril first line to treat the hypertension in that postnatal period. But if women are of Black African or African Caribbean family origin, we'd consider nifedipine or amlodipine first line instead, and that's because they respond better to calcium channel blockers, which we mentioned in the normal guidelines. If blood pressure isn't controlled with a single drug, then would consider a combination of nifedipine or amlodipine and enalapril. If this combination isn't tolerated or ineffective, then would consider adding in or swapping in labetalol or atenolol to the combination treatment. Women with hypertension in the postnatal period who don't plan to breastfeed should be treated in the same way as normal. So the guidelines that we've already discussed. So that's all for hypertension. I hope you found the summary on hypertension useful, including the thresholds, the targets and the drug treatments. Feel free to leave any feedback or comments and keep an eye on our Pharmacy Instagram page where we'll be doing a quick, a quick quiz on hypertension. Thank you.